Did you know it's now a hundred years since drugs were first banned? Do you know about the war on drugs? Do you understand what you think drug addiction is and the way in which drug addiction should be treated? Do you have any idea at all what happens to a nice wrap of cocaine before it reaches an Islington dinner party? Do you know what are the casualties en route? Do you understand drugs, do you think? Uh, the other day there was a front page story about drugs. I've got it in front of me here, front page of the Telegraph. It said, can dealers at the school gate given slap on wrist. Dealers who sell drugs outside schools are being led off with a slap on the wrist by police instead of facing prosecution. The magistrate's leader warned. Well, somebody who's been not just a living this night, day and everything else, but travelling the world uh, to bring us the story of drugs and, and the war upon them is Johan Harry, the columnist, and he joins me here. His new book is called Chasing the Scream, the first and last days of the war on drugs. Welcome to the studio. Hi, Vanessa. It's great to be with you. Why did you decide that this was something that you wanted to to, to research in such minute detail, in fact, devote your life to for several years? I think there were lots of reasons. One of them is a bit difficult to talk about, but you know, one of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And as I got older, I realised there was addiction in my family and uh, I, I had another relative who became very seriously addicted and I also had a relationship with someone who's very seriously addicted. And I really wanted to understand, I guess, you know, what causes addiction, what causes drug use, but also... Why do we react to it the way that we do? Why have we for a 100 years thought the best way to respond is to kind of have a war on addicts and try to prevent these chemicals from existing? And I wanted to know how the alternatives work. And one of the things that really surprised me, you know, I travelled 30,000 miles, I went to loads of different countries, I met so many different people from a, you know, a transsexual crack dealer in Brooklyn to a, the first country to ever decriminalise all drugs. Mm. And what I discovered that really surprised me is almost everything we are raised to think about this subject is wrong. Drugs aren't what we think they are. Drug addiction is not what we think it is. Uh, the drug war is not what we think it is. And drug legalisation is not what we think it is. There's a real, um, it really blows your mind when, the more you look at this subject to think about how, how we've been misinformed about it. I suppose what we think is that there are at large these horribly uh, addictive, noxious, poisonous substances and there are people who fall prey to these substances and we always hear about the person getting that first amazing idyllic euphoric hit of whatever the drug is sometimes we hear that it's cannabis and it's a gateway drug to, to, to other drugs sometimes we hear it's you know crack cocaine that you'll never ever again feel that moment of utter earthly bliss and therefore you will find yourself sucked into some hideous vortex by which you will chase that thrill and chase that thrill and you'll end up you know uh, in train spotting you know some some you know crack addict in a doorway with your life in tatters and shreds and there'll be people listening to this and that will have been their journey and also people whose children will have been along that journey and they'll be thinking, well, Vanessa's describing exactly what really does happen. What's Johan Harry got to say about that? What blew my mind as I went and interviewed lots of scientists who work on this is that I would totally believe that about addiction as well. I did believe that, and I, as I've seen the tragedy of addiction up yeah. close. Actually, that's not what causes addiction. That story is almost entirely mythological from the beginning. One of the best ways to start to explain it is most of us think about addiction. When we think about addiction, we think, well, what causes drug addiction? It would seem like almost a stupid question. Drugs cause drug addiction, uh -huh. right? We think that if you and me, for the next 20 days, you use a powerful drug, on day 21, our bodies will physically need it, and that's how it works, right? Yes. And Seems also that it will make us feel good, yeah. and we'll want to feel good, and then we'll feel disinhibited, so yeah. we'll feel more exciting, and it will either calm us or, or, or rouse us, and whatever it is, it will be that chemical and if we hadn't had that we'd had a cheese sandwich yeah. or we hadn't had that we'd had a, a glass of vimto exactly. we wouldn't feel that after 21 days one of the ways that was established that that theory was established in the 1950s they did a load of exper experiments with rats it's a really simple experiment you get a rat you, rats re respond to heroin and cocaine the same way humans do right you get a rat you put it in a cage it's got two water bottles one's just water and one's water laced with either heroin or cocaine if you do that, the rat will always, almost always prefer the heroin or cocaine and will mm. almost always kill itself very, very quickly. Right. So you thought, well, there you go. That's, that's the common sense theory that we all have. In the 1970s, a guy I write about in the book, an amazing man called Bruce Alexander, who's a professor in Vancouver, came along and said, hang on a minute, we're putting the rat in an empty cage. It's got nothing to do but use this drug water. Let's do this differently. So he built Rat Park. Yeah. Rat Park has everything a rat about town could want. It's got loads of cheese, loads of coloured balls, yeah. and crucially, lots of friends. Yeah. And they've got both the water bottles, just like the rats in the isolated cage. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they all try both water bottles because they don't know what's in them. Virtually none of the rats, bear in mind, nine out of ten overdosed in, in, when they were isolated. Literally none of the rats ever overdose in Rat Park. They don't like it. Some of them use a very small amount of the drug water. Most of them don't like it at all. Mm -hmm. 
what that tells us that's really important and there's a really important human application to this mm. is drug addiction is not caused by the drug drug addiction is caused by your environment if you're in a happy connected environment you don't want to use chronically all the time. You don't want to rely heavily on drugs. It's when you are isolated, when you're disconnected or when you're traumatised do you want to use drugs heavily. There are loads of human examples about this. If you think about, for example, the Vietnam War, huge numbers of American soldiers in Vietnam, about 20%, were using heroin, right? And the Nixon White House was rightly very worried. They thought, my God, these people are going to all come home mm. and they're going to be heroin addicts. Mm. Actually, they all came home. Virtually none of them were heroin addicts. They didn't go to rehab. Nothing happened. They were taken out of a horrific and terrifying environment and they were put into a healthy environment mm -hmm. where they didn't want to use drugs. When I first learned that... Sorry to interrupt, mm, but sure, there, there are going to be people listening, obviously, who are thinking, hang on a minute, you know, Johan Harry sounds like a plausible guy and I'm sure he's done his research, but but hang on a minute. You know, sure. my, my, they'll be thinking, my cousin, you know, was at university, was on course to have a great job, was, was, was pretty, was fancied, had friends, people liked her, and somehow or other, this girl who was gregarious and, and had a lot of vitality turned into a drug addict. Or, you know, my, 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 uh, my colleague, colleague, you know, uh, highly, highly upwardly mobile, extremely successful at work, married with kids, has become a wildly addicted to cocaine and to the point where it really is beginning to show. And sure, this person might have uh, identified themselves as, as a, a recreational drug user only and then and leading a normal life. But actually, you know, in the end or, or around about now, it's beginning to have a terrible effect on him or her. And also we have lots of calls when we talk about um, legalising marijuana, we get callers saying, you know, gosh, Vanessa, actually, you know, yes, I have lived a, a, a reasonable life on 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 you know quite a lot of, of of spliffing out but i think that it's taken a really big toll of me and i and you know now it's really beginning to catch up with me and i blah 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 that kind of stuff so so i don't know whether people necessarily accept that it's only if you're lonely or disaffected or isolated or damaged or weird or something that you would take think, drugs and that's exactly how i felt when i spoke to a huge number of scientists i put these points to them and i was really surprised when i looked at the research to discover they were right i'll give you one example there's loads of examples but i'll give you one i mean the book is mostly the stories of human beings and how their lives have changed but yes. um I'll give you one example if you or I step out of this studio today and mm. we're run over, we're hit by a car, God forbid, mm. um, and break our hips, we'll be given a huge amount of diamorphine in hospital for the pain. Mm. Diamorphine is heroin. It's right. actually much more potent heroin than the kind we'd buy if we were to go and buy it from a street dealer because it's pure. Right. That happens in every hospital in every country in the world all the time. You're often given it for quite a long time. Mm. Virtually nobody steps out of that hospital and tries to score heroin on the streets, even though they've been given heroin for a very long time. In fact, they don't even really go through much withdrawal. Now, if what we believed about drugs, drug, what I believed and you're saying, and a huge number of listeners will rightly be mm. thinking, uh, was right about drugs, that the drug causes the addiction, the drug is the primary cause of the addiction, then that wouldn't make any sense. And yet that's the experience of all over the world in every hospital all the time. And I know it is very strange to get your head around this, but the evidence is really clear. I think it's also worth pointing out, even the UN Office of Drug Control, which is the main kind of drug war body in the world, says 90% of um, all drug use is non-problematic. So it doesn't cause a problem to the user in any way, mm -hmm. which again is hard to get your head around because, of course, certainly in my life, I've seen the people who are harmed by it. It would be like if the picture we had of alcohol users was a homeless person necking in the gutter mm -hmm. and not the fact that the vast majority of people who drink don't have a problem with it. Mm. I think also one thing that was really fascinating to me, you know, going around and meeting all sorts of different people who were affected by this was seeing this turn from a theory into something where people actually try. Um, 15 years ago, Portugal had a terrible drug problem. 1% of the entire population was addicted to heroin, which is mind blowing. Mm. And they tried the American drug war approach, you know, arrest everyone, round them up, punish them, put them in prison for a really long time. And the problem was just getting worse and worse. So an amazing man called Dr. Juan Gulao, who I got to know really well, decided to, was, was asked by the government, he ran a drug rehab centre. He was asked by the government to set up a panel to say, look, how should we do this differently? And he went away and he said, look, why don't we decriminalise all drugs, which sounds really radical, mm. everything, and use all the money we currently spend on arresting drug users, putting them in prison, you know, all that police time and court time, spend all of that on reconnecting drug users with society. So it's the exact opposite of the drug war. What we do is we give addicts criminal records and cut them off and make it harder for them to reconnect. What Huao did 
And the Portuguese, there was subsidised jobs for addicts, really intensive emotional support for addicts. And the results have been really incredible. We don't have to talk about this theoretically. Yes. Injecting drug use has fallen by 50%, percent five zero percent Wow. It's my, when you go to Portugal, I, you know, I was worried to go to Portugal because although I was very sympathetic to reform, there was a bit of me that thought, God, well, what if I go and it doesn't work? Mm. The, one of the most moving interviews I had was with a guy called Juan Figueroa who's the head of the drug police in Portugal. And he was the main opponent of the decriminalisation. He said, this is madness, don't do it. it. The things that lots of people will be thinking as they listen to this. Mm -hmm. When I went and met him 15 years later, he said, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, everything I said would happen didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Everything the other side said would happen did happen. Now things are dramatically better. Virtually no one in Portugal wants to go back. So I think the thing that's really exciting about this and that gives me hope is the alternatives work. We can actually reduce addiction. We can actually reduce problematic drug use. But the solution isn't punishment, chastisement, hatred. It's support and love and compassion and policies based on that. Let, let me bring in my caller because Ben's on the mm. line in Moorgate. Hello, Ben. Morning to you. Hi, Vanessa. And I tell you, I'll just tell Johan what it says on my screen mm. just to save time, if you don't mind, my love. Sure. It says, <laughs> it says, recovering addict and alcoholic. Hi, Ben. That's right. Hi. So you've been listening to Johan. What, what, what have you, what's been your response so far? Well, my, my concern is that um, saying that it's all about environment, um, really, in my experience, and being in terms of being in Alcoholics Anonymous, being in, working in prisons with recovering addicts and alcoholics, um, but also coming across people that have come from very, very good backgrounds who've had real problems with addiction. Um, so that, the, the, the kind of um, rat park thing didn't really stand up for me, you know, because my experience has been very different. There's been people I've come across who've come from very loving, caring, loving family backgrounds who have ended up with terrible addiction problems. And... Um, What's been the solution is really being able to work through the 12 step program and being able to talk about how they feel, you know, and working through the issues that come up with addiction, um, which are often emotional, emotionally led. And also there's a spiritual aspect, and I don't mean religion because I'm mm. not religious, that's very important for recovering addicts and alcoholics that needs to be engaged. Must it does sound to me um, that you're, you're both talking from exactly the same kind of perspective. Not You're not at odds at all on this, are you? Yeah. I think, uh, well, first say to Ben, congratulations on your on your recovery and, and um, you. I really admire that. And um, I completely agree with you that 12-step programmes are a fantastic support. I've got people I love who, who I think whose lives have been saved by 12-step programmes. I also think you're right to say it's not... 100% environment. There's actually a, a really interesting experiment that weirdly loads of people listening to this program will have taken part in, which tells us how much of it is the drug versus the environment. It's nicotine patches. Mm. When nicotine patches were first invented, there was this huge wave of optimism among scientists because the actual drug that you're addicted to when you smoke is nicotine, right? And nicotine patch gives it to you. Yeah. So they thought, great, people won't need to smoke anymore. It's, you know, and actually what happened is 17% of people who use nicotine patches stop and 83% don't. Now, 17% is a big deal, right? So 17% of cigarette smoking, we can conclude, is the actual physical drug addiction. Yes. But 83%, something else is going on. And I think the 83% is the environmental factor. I think what you're saying, though, Ben, is, is, is really important. And I think also... When we talk about people being disconnected and isolated, that's not about poverty. Obviously, poverty makes it worse. But actually, and I totally agree with you, I know lots of people with, um, you know, from, and certainly not from poor families who become uh, addicted. There's a really fascinating study, I'd, uh, I'd be interested for you to, to know what you think of it, Ben, if you get a chance to look it up, called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which is not about poverty. It looked at um, things that drive addiction and things that correlate with addiction. And what it found was incredible. For every traumatic experience a person has as a child, they are two times more likely to grow up to be an adult drug user. Wow. So 70% of injecting adult drug use they found is caused by childhood trauma. Now, you can have a childhood, you can be from a rich family, mm. and if your father drowns, as happened to someone I know, or, you know, all sorts of things, that, that's a horrific trauma. So, th and, But it's partly because if you go through childhood trauma, as you get older, you don't trust the world. It's much more scary. I'm sure this will be the experience of lots of the people you, you work with in prison, agree, which is amazing. I, I agree, but I, I think statistics, you know, you can throw statistics here, there, and everywhere, and they don't really connect emotionally with anyone when talking about these kind of issues. You know, and for me, I think, um, you know, what addicts and addicts and alcoholics find difficult is dealing with life on life's terms, mm -hmm. you know, which is a bigger issue in, in, in itself, where what is it that's failing people where they can't deal with problems in life, where they have to turn to something to get high or to get away from feeling 
pain or feeling difficulty around issues. Well, it is interesting, think, isn't it, how we seem to accept, certainly where drink is concerned, that, that, that that's just a given. You know, you wanna get, you're going to want to get out of it somehow. That's, that's how we celebrate. That's how we cut loose. That's how we feel better about ourselves. That's how we set about having a good time. We, you know, the idea of, of a teetotaler who, who at the end of the evening is exactly the same as they were at the beginning of the evening. I think lots of people find that absolutely abhorrent. But I think Ben's, no, Ben's totally. making a really important point. I think, Ben, you're totally right. As you say that, I think about two, two places I went. One was Arizona. Um, the prisons in Arizona, I went to the, uh, a place called Tent City, where they force women who've been at men and women, but I went out with the women's chain gang. They force women who've been addicts to go out on chain gangs. And I read wearing, that part of the book. Yeah. That was really, I, I, could, I could barely read it, actually. I mean, the, it was, the way they hu- humiliate these addicted women yeah. is really quite extraordinary. These, the things they make them say and the things they make them wear and the things they make them do and the way in which they keep them are absolutely horrific. Yeah, yeah they make them, they, make, they isolate them. And, and then, I, then I went, as I said, to, to Portugal and to Switzerland where heroin is provided to addicts legally and they're given a huge amount of support to stop. And um, you, you think you're totally right. The contrast between the model where they humiliate people, they brutalise those women I met in Arizona, they're not going to be able to reconnect with their emotions. They're going to be, they're going to, sh- they were shutting down. It was but, a But horrend- why, why don't we look at creating a culture where we do connect with our emotions, starting mm-hmm. at school, where children can talk about how they feel, you know, where, where we have a class like like religious education used to kind of try and do, but never, never really succeeded. But we need to have it in education from an early stage where human beings, children, are able to engage in their emotions, talk about how they feel. Because my, this might be a bit controversial, but I think we're all addicts in our own little ways. You know, we're, whether it's chocolate, food... Um, whether it's TV, whether it's I, I want to ask Kevin whether he agrees. You know, do, you agree? do you think we? Because hang on a minute, Ben. Do, do you think that's true? Because some people might say, "Well, actually, I'm not." You know, yes, I like sex, but only in a measured sort of way, and with the person I'm meant to be having it with. And sure, I like chocolate, but I wouldn't say I binge on it. And yes, I drink sometimes, but I'm not a manic drinker. I don't gamble to excess. You know, actually, I'm not addicted. I mean, are there some people who are not, or are we all addicted to something or other? Well, I think it's a matter of degrees, isn't it? We all have things we kind of think we shouldn't do, but do anyway, and yeah. have compulsions. You know, and obviously. But I suppose There's, addiction is only it's only called addiction when it begins to ruin your life, isn't it? Sure, when you start I mean, doing it and you don't want to do it, but you're doing it anyway. But, it, but it's a continuum, and I think it's not like a binary thing where you, one side you've got people who are addicts and one side who aren't. Actually... You know, there's a lot of people who feel addicted to their smartphones, for example. Right. Now, that's, of course, much less problematic than mm. being addicted to crack. But I, I think also Ben makes a really important point. Bruce Alexander, whose, whose story is in the book, this incredible professor who has transformed how we think about drug addiction and also an incredible man called Dr. Gabor Mate, who was smuggled out of the Budapest ghetto during the Holocaust and because of his experiences learned about childhood trauma and then discovered what the role of childhood trauma causes in addiction. What they both talk about is we obviously need individual recovery and we talk a lot about that actually we need social recovery we need as a society to learn how to reconnect with each other yes. and i think ben's suggestion about how we do that in schools is really important that's another thing they do in portugal i think you're totally right thank you thank you for calling ben now, now one of it you, the book is very interesting because you've you've you've, you've rendered it in such a human and and and, and immediately sort of um, uh, piercingly kind of emotional way because you've done it primarily through interviews with individual people and stories of their lives that's why it, it works so very well um but you tell the story um of billy holiday Mm. And, and and can you explain what that's got to do with it and why it is you do that? It's funny, actually, it comes back to what, what Ben said that I think is so right as well. I promise I didn't plant him. <laughs> the, yeah, uh, the, we um, believe you. The, the, you know, in we need to understand these things emotionally. You can quote all the statistics in the world and actually it's not very persuasive, which is why the book is not really about that. Although, you know, I, dr- I try to relate it to the evidence, but mostly it's stories of individuals. The story about Billie Holiday really blew my mind. At the very birth of the of the war on drugs... Billie Holiday, 1939, stands up in New York City and performs the song Strange Fruit, which is a song about lynching. And as her biographer Julia, Bert, um, Julia Blackburn describes, she, um, she then gets a threat from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and it says, stop singing this song, we don't like it. Yes. And it was I must run- say that, that connects, doesn't it, to what we've been talking about all day about the cartoons in France? Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it does. You it might really want to just say that a bit louder with capital letters. <laughs> it really Seriously, does. Seriously, yeah. say yeah. that again. Billie yeah. Holiday was singing a song. To, can you can you remember the lyrics? I read it yesterday in the book. Um, I'm something about the tree with blood it's on its basically, roots. It's based on she's, the image of the idea of lynching. lynch bodies yes. hanging down from trees yes. all over the deep yes. south. And It's uh, about there's a tree blooming the, in the south exactly. with blood on its roots. And the idea that's, and of course her father died in the south because he couldn't find a doctor to treat him when he had a really simple illness. So yes. this, was, this was very raw and real to Billie Holiday. Her great-grandmother had been a slave. She knew her great-grandmother who had been a slave. And... 
she was told exactly like you know the people the incredibly heroic people at charlie hebdo uh do not sing this song we don't want you doing it. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics was run by a man called Harry Anslinger. Well, I should just say, at that point, the songs that were acceptable were about love, and that was it. Yeah, to have... The Moon and June, and yeah. she was singing a song about a tree with blood on its roots. I mean, this is, this is really germane to what we're talking yeah. about all morning, isn't to it? Have, to have an African-American woman yeah. standing up in front of a largely white audience singing and singing song. a song against lynching. Yeah. Some, one person called it the musical starting gun for the civil rights movement. You see, movement. some of my callers today would have said, Billie Holiday, why don't you show some common sense? Don't sing that song. You're deliberately provoking people. That's what they would have well, said. Nothing <laughs> worth say, nothing worth saying doesn't provoke somebody. Right. You know. So Billie every, Holiday carried we, on we singing all, it. This is yeah, the point, the, isn't it? So she refused to stop singing her song. The man who ran the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, I think it was the most influential man no one's ever heard of, Harry Anslinger, the inventor of modern drug policies hounded her he's first of all he sent a black agent to stalk her for for, for two years <coughs> his name was jimmy fletcher he, yes harry anslinger hated employing black people but you couldn't send a white guy into harlem to stalk billy holiday it'd be pretty conspicuous yeah and the story what happened is really heartbreaking so he jimmy fletcher she was so amazing that two years stalking her he fell in love with her and he felt really ashamed of what he did to her she was put on trial she said the trial was called um, the United States versus Billie Holiday and that's how it felt. Yeah. She was sent to prison. It's a bit like what we were discussing earlier. She didn't sing a note in prison. She came out and she couldn't get a job because you could only, you, in order to get a license to perform anywhere where alcohol was served, you need a license. She sinks back into addiction. Her life falls apart. Uh, she, she's really broken by this and Harry Ansling has not finished with her. He sends a man called George White, a kind of morbidly obese white sadist who we now know was a rapist, a man who himself used drugs, a man who actually uh, drugged women's drinks in order to sexually assault them. He was then, he said, we're going to kick her down the stairs. And they did. When Billie Holiday in her early 40s collapses with lung cancer, she's taken to hospital. The hospital refuses to take her in, she has to be taken to another one. She's taken to hospital and they arrest, she's got liver cancer, they arrest her on her deathbed. Oh. They handcuff her, they take away everything she has, they don't let her friends in to see her. One of her friends, in, she starts to get very sick because she's in withdrawal. One of her friends insists they give her methadone. That happens for 10 days, she starts to get a little bit better. They cut off the methadone and she dies. One of the, I spoke to an incredible man called Eugene, I interviewed an incredible man called Eugene Callender, who uh, led the protests outside that hospital. You know, that did not have to happen. And, um, but I think the really important thing to remember is what you just said. She never stopped singing that song. She ne like the people at Charlie Hebdo, she did not let herself be intimidated. One of her friends, Annie Ross, the amazing jazz singer, said to me, Billie Holiday was as strong as she could be. And I think that also the really important thing is one of the things I wanted to talk about is in, in the book is and we, we've been taught for so long to see Alex as these disgusting, depraved people. One of the things I know from my own family and I know from the stories in the book and from a lot of the people I got to know for the book is that Alex can be incredibly brave and admirable people. Thank you so much for coming in. I mean, it's been a Thanks very busy morning, as you can imagine. Sure. We've got so many people who want to talk about what happened in Paris, and of that's course. why we're going to do that with the last half hour of the programme. Otherwise, I would have been very happy to talk about this fascinating book for longer. The book is called Chasing the Scream. It's extremely, I know you might find this surprising, extremely readable. Will you believe me when I say it's incredibly entertaining? It's enormously emotionally affecting quite hard to read it with both eyes open you kind of want to scrunch them up and almost hide under the bed while you're reading it and yet you kind of can't stop uh it really is uh, an extraordinary book um and uh, and it's called chasing the scream uh it published by bloomsbury circus it's 1899 in hardback and it's by my guest johan harry thank you so much for coming in such a pleasure uh, and we're going to carry on with